Welcome, Liz. Hi. Welcome in the Women Up podcast show. I'm very happy for you to be here today. And thank you, thank you for accepting the invitation. Oh, thank you. I'm really, really happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. So um, let me introduce you to our audience. So Liz is a sole purpose coach who is obsessed with helping women transform their biggest challenges into their superpower. And she's supporting women to move beyond their stories and owning their life shocks as their greatest teachers on the journey to transform. So she supports women to awaken and to be who they really are through deeper inner connection, seeing through the programming and moving beyond limiting beliefs so that they can live a rewarding life, um, soul-led life. As a sound practitioner as well, Liz is increasingly inviting sound into her coaching practice as well as in person relaxing sound baths. Liz has a master's degree in integrative psychotherapy and worked as a therapist for over 10 years. So Liz is also certified Beautiful You life coach and a cancer, cancer driver for over eight years. So this life shock actually led her to her passion of helping women around the world to live lives with joy, purpose, and freedom. So that's a lot about you. And I love uh, who you are, based on description. Uh, but tell us maybe, what do we need to know to fully maybe understand you, who you are currently this day, and something about your journey? Okay. <clears throat> So to understand me, where I am today, I could say a lot of things. I reflected on this podcast and I could say, you know, how important family relationships are to me. And that's true. Um, my work is very important to me. I love helping people um, to facilitating, you know, because it comes from the individual you know, we can't tell people what to do. And that's not a great thing, not a great thing to do, but to help people become who they're truly meant to be. Um, I am a seeker. I'm always seeking knowledge and truth. And I see this life as, I hope it doesn't sound like a cliche, but like a school, you know, that I'm here to learn, to grow, and to become the best version of me. And in so doing, that overflow will help and does other people. Mm. I'm sure you have some own challenges which you have to overcome and that made you who you are today. As you said, you are seeking, you are growing. I love that. And I can resonate with that mm. completely. Um, tell us maybe what happened. Uh, what was maybe the biggest kind of a life shock in your life that really like mainly shaped who you are today okay yeah um that was in 2015 I uh, had a, ca a cancer diagnosis I had a sarcoma well three sarcomas in my left breast um no history of breast cancers in my family that I'm aware of and I have a big family actually um and so it was a huge shock at age 43 um so that, I would say, was the biggest personal life shock. I've experienced bereavements um, and other things, which, you know, I'm happy to discuss. But of, of late, and the biggest would definitely be that one. Um, it changed my life, actually. Changed your life. Mm, I'm sure that must have been really tough. Mm, yeah. To find, to find out and to go through that phase. Yeah, it was. Um so this is how my work began. I was working as a, um, a therapist. I had a, a part-time practice and um, and I also was working in a, in a university as a student counsellor and something intuitively, instinctively within me, I knew something was up actually um, and I didn't know what it was um, and I and, um, and I was actually in therapy at the time and uh, said and said something like this to my, my own therapist that I just can't get to what it is. And then I was diagnosed with, with cancer. And um, I took a, a significant amount of time out of work because I had, I think over that period of like, I don't know if it's about 12, 15 months, I had five surgeries. And so, you know, and one of them was a major surgery. And so I, you know, obviously dealing with clients you're not in the right place when you're yeah. grappling with a trauma and actually PTSD, I would say. 
so so yeah that was um a huge shock and I went um through you know the whole kind of cycle that we do of the shock and disbelief um the grieving process as I had a um full mastectomy um with delayed reconstruction so I was without a breast for like um 13 months so that was really kicked my self-esteem um I've actually written a blog about this um which I'm happy to share with with listeners it's on my my website um at, that talks about briefly what happened but the eight kind of lessons that I learned from that experience which I'm happy to obviously share those those here but I think you go through the the, the initial shock and I'd say devastation it, it depends on the individual and um and, and it's not linear is it in life we don't kind of go through these phases and it just arrive at some point it kind of weaves in and out it's like a spiral you know the fear the anxiety and and then when you began, or at least I'll speak for myself, when I began, began to come out of the other side, when I'd had the surgeries over, I was given all clear that it hadn't been thankfully metastatic, um, that you begin to rebuild your life, but from a different standpoint. Um, I had a, a very significant spiritual awakening. And that was one of the biggest things that came out for me in that and and by spiritual awakening I literally it means many things to me but for the purposes of of this conversation it is it was very much about being more conscious more awake more honest with myself about and literally like my eyes had been opened to a lot of things in my life and and, and about the world around me and this what is things, when I think, what things did you, have you made yourself being more conscious about what what exactly or may, can you give us an example <clears throat> more awake more open yeah sure um so I would say that where I was in my life I was in a lot of stress I think I was experiencing burnout in the workplace or in in life generally um in the lead up to that I'd had two significant um uh, bereavements one being my father and I think it had all accumulated and um, and so it made me reflect on what I wanted and actually led to me uh, uh, after time off work except uh, you know asking requesting actually rather than going back to work um, to for um, you know redundancy and so I went through that process and took time out to explore what I wanted to do and um, and that's how I arrived at coaching. And yes, it's very it can be seen as quite similar, um, you know, therapy, counselling, and coaching. But there there are differences, of course. And for me, I wanted to work with women who had come out of life shocks or just at a I don't know a junction in their life, and they wanted to more deeply connect with who they are at soul level, and and live with more purpose, live more authentically owning their own power and that is a process I think all of this is a process there's not a you know magic pill that we can <laughs> swallow unfortunately I wish there um, was <laughs> yeah yeah I think I think many of us do and I remember it's actually when I was reflecting on this podcast I remember that when I first had my first therapy um many years ago actually I, I um sort of different experiences of life led me to therapy in my 20s and I remember having the first session with a therapist and saying I had this list I thought I want to work through this 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 and I don't want it to take any longer than six months thank you very much <laughs> <laughs> and I remember the look on his face like well she's deluded no <laughs> pressure <is> <laughs> And I think, you know, I was very young and I think you realise that it's it's um, a process. It's, uh, you know, it's just a continuing journey. I hope I'm answering your, your question yes, there. You do. You do. Yeah. yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, it is a journey. It is a process we need to go through and step by step. I think we need to build those blocks, becoming stronger, maybe the foundation for future changes. Um you mentioned a few things and I will go back, back to a few of them. So um, the life shocking form of being diagnosed with cancer, 
you said it was the turning point, basically. Um, I think there is this quote about the change when we are ready to change or we are open to change when the pain from the current situation is bigger than the fear or the pain from changing, actually. Mm. So maybe that was also the kind of situation that happened to you or the place where you have been. Yeah, I'm trying to think who that who wrote that quote, actually. But, but yeah. I, I do know. Excuse my throat a bit. I'm just recovering, as, as you it's know. Okay. Um, I think that's right. And, and that's why I think it's important for us to, as much as we can, address the, the challenges, the traumas and all of that in our life. Because if we bypass them, they, I really do believe, uh, I don't like sweeping generalized statements as a rule, but I do believe by and large, they will come back to, to us time and time again until we learn that. And actually, I think we get prompts, we get nudges uh, from the universe, from you know our higher selves that kind of say, you know, hey, take a look at this, you know, give this some attention. And we're busy sometimes and we brush it to one side and and knocking on the door again and if we don't listen to those then I think something bigger can come and I don't mean that in a scaremongering way but if we can get more sensitive to noticing these little prompts from the universe from ourselves that something needs addressing I think it can really it not in every scenario but in a lot of cases it can head off more bigger challenges and bigger things to deal with yeah um i keep thinking about the you mentioned ptsd or like a trauma generally um do you think there is a person in this universal world who haven't experienced trauma because there are different types or trauma can be understand understood in different ways and there are minor or bigger kind of traumas but like generally speaking i don't want to know your opinion as a maybe psychotherapist um mm. working uh, as a therapist for over 10 years so yeah. what is your opinion about that mm. yeah just to be clear I'm I, at the moment um I worked for 10 years I'm not yeah. at the moment I haven't been for some years I just wanted to make that clear but of course I bring that part with, of me um that's just integrated into me now yeah. Uh, yeah I completely agree I don't think there's anybody alive or has lived hasn't received experienced some level of tra trauma and you could say small t you know and then there's the big T, you know, and then there's PTSD. <laughs> um, and I know that there are different forms, you know, different recognized forms of that right now. But so I see life generally, this is how I generally see things is a spectrum. Mm. You know, life is a spectrum, you know, love, you know, um, and you can, I can relate this to um, to trauma. And it's it's everything from the extreme end to the the lesser end. And it's very individualistic. And what some individual may experience as a huge trauma may not be for one. And some person might experience something that seems relatively small to another. And it's huge to them. So I think it's important for us not to judge ourselves or others. Um, so. And I also believe, I mean. Our formative years are, are huge. I mean, I don't think anybody would argue that, you know, from the age of what, zero to about eight years old, our brain, our brain waves are in theta mode. Um, you know, the different brain waves from like beta, alpha, theta, et cetera. And that literally is the kind of meditative receiver because we're little humans and we are needing to download and learn all the things we need to be a, a human being you know a human being a functioning human being and of course not everybody starts on this equal footing I mean that I don't think that's uh, arguable whether it be through a family upbringing schooling race where you were born in the world that and so much more and people are you know if you're exposed to high levels of um, traumatic experience at a young age, it, it, it does have a huge effect. And I, I don't want to paint a picture of doom and gloom because I certainly think it's possible to overcome those. And But I do think it's, it's worth recognising that when we experience traumas at a young age, that it can have quite a profound effect. But there are things out there, and I think the sooner that it's managed or 
addressed, not managed, addressed, the better. And I think there's also, you know, generational trauma. And that I believe that's now been, um, I don't want to misquote, but I believe that's kind of been proven to carry through DNA for like seven generations or something. Mm, really? Yeah, I believe so. I hope that I'm accurate in saying that, but I, I'm pretty sure it's, but it is certainly carried down and argued, but you've always got that nature nurture mm. debate. I'm a believer that it's a combination mm. because of course, if generations have experienced something that's going to be affected in the, in our cells, in the being that's then passed through DNA, but also um, unless that person has fully dealt with it and let's be honest you know generations ago it wasn't always easily accessible to get this kind of uh, help then it's the nurture aspect um yeah I hope, yeah if somebody's listening and um they heard you saying general generational trauma i they don't know quite what what do you mean by that well i'll speak from my my own experience i didn't put it in my um in my um, profile, my bio, um, but I'm from a, a you know Romani Gypsy background. That is my background, and you know I'm the first generation of a settled people in my family. Well, my parents settled, but they were uh, you know born in um, in um, traveling, and so just speaking from the eye, from my own experience, is you know if you you belong to a I don't know an ethnic group that has experienced hatred and, and all the other things, then that can be very much internalized. Uh, for example, it's been recognized and studied that in the um, gypsy community, traveler gypsy community, that levels of anxiety tend to be higher mm. um, than the general population. Um, and I'm, I'm sure that's true of other groups as well, ethnic groups. Um, so so when I say generational trauma, it, it doesn't have to be ethnicity. It could be um, anything, really. It could be abuse. It could be, I don't know, being born or whatever in a, in a war-torn um, situation and, you know, not being in a situation of privilege, as many of us are in, in uh, the West. Um, so that's what I'm talking about, that it then gets passed through. And I, I would argue that it's, it's the same as I was saying earlier, which is, you know, genetically and um, uh, nature nurture. I mean, I can say more about that. I don't know if you have any more questions, but I can say more about how I think we can ad address, you know, that, but. Yeah, firstly, before that, I think I would like to address um, what you mentioned previously about we need to, or in order for us to, to heal or to, address that conditioning maybe or traumas that we are having imprinted uh, what do we need to pay attention to or what maybe we need to develop in order to be able to recognize and spot the signs of okay this is triggering me now I need to heal this part of me okay so you're you're asking if um how we can be more conscious of it in order mm -hmm. to address it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm just clarifying. So I make yeah, sure yeah, 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 I yeah, yeah. the right thing. <laughs> um, well, I think first and foremost, it's awareness um, bringing more consciousness. Um, I believe one of the ways to do, to do that, as, as, as I said, it's the universe sometimes delivers, you know, downloads or, you know, leaps forward but by and large it's little by little step by step and so it might just be something that you're noticing some behavior that is a pattern or some way you react or thoughts negative uh destructive thoughts that you know one of your you know your viewers may be having and then they think and just paying attention to that i think for me uh, mindfulness was a huge part in that mm. um in developing um, the observer self. Do you know what I mean by that? Uh, not really. Yeah, right. So how I see that, how it worked for me, um, I did train in mindfulness uh, meditation. Um, and that is when we are, we can become very enmeshed in our experience. It's like this. You now when you're so, they say, I can't see the wood from the trees. Mm -hmm. You heard the expression. Yeah. It's like that. It's so part of you, you can't see it. 
So by developing some form of practice where you're still, and I could say a little bit more about that in a minute, but where you're still, maybe it's a mindfulness practice, maybe it's nature, maybe it's Qigong, whatever it is, it doesn't matter because it's individualistic, but let's just take mindfulness. Cultivating just this awareness, bringing attention, and in time, you develop, I believe, what you know, the observer self, meaning that the, you're able to kind of slightly observe. There's a little bit of distance rather than this in it. Mm -hmm. So when we cultivate this, we are less likely to react. We, we, we give that uh, opportunity to respond. Um, and it reminds me of that quote, and I'm, I, I hope I'm going to be able to remember it. <laughs> now I've said it by Viktor Frankl. Mm -hmm. uh, and he talks about, I actually can't remember it right on the spot right here, but it's that sense of like, what I'm talking about is when we have that space um i can i can look it up and, maybe and it's the one may, maybe uh, just came to my mind like there is a there is this space for you to decide between stimulus and reaction yes thank you yeah um that's, so that's the that's the space where basically it's your choice to absolutely thank you thank that's you for remembering i think just being on the spot here oh, we are on the same same line i think we are on the same vibe kind of we like, totally are yeah. so thank you for that you're right it's that, that between stimulus and response and it's a cultivation it's something we continue through all of our lives and that space gives us that because think about it reactivity you know once you've done that reactive thing that cause and effect we don't have any choice on what follows so it's so important to cultivate that so bringing awareness developing the what i like to call the observer self which mm -hmm. is that bit of space that bit of distance that we can get to um, response rather than reactive hugely in this i think is and again it's another part of mindfulness which is the mindful attitudes bringing to all of this huge amounts of compassion and kindness, generosity towards ourselves, because we will not get it inverted commas right all the time. We will trip up. We will react and shout at somebody or whatever. <laughs> um, and it's about learning from that and not um, beating ourselves up, you know, the self-flagellation that can happen. Um, and it's moving forward, ever forward. Yeah, I hope I've answered your, your yeah. question now. How do I have more to say if you want? Yeah, self-awareness and building it through mindfulness and distancing ourselves from, um, from ourselves, basically. Like, what we think is ourselves. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and that, actually, um, it's a lot of it is just the ego, isn't it? It isn't the true self. It's the ego that's developed that we need. We need an ego to exist in this world. But if we get too attached to the ego, it's very much, you know, I, I love the work of Eckhart Tolle in this. If we get very drawn into the ego, this is where we kind of get into trouble. We're spending more time in that kind of, in, in the oneness, in meditation, that, that connected to the whole, in order to kind of really receive the trueness of who we are, rather than getting caught up in the ego, ego part, if that makes sense. But one, one thing I didn't say that I'd like to, if I may, is with generational trauma or any trauma at all, um, we're saying about taking responsibility and it's like making that decision that, you know what, it stops with me. I'm going to take responsibility. Yes, I can talk about it and deal with, you know, how unfair it might have been at some point, but there comes a point where we need to, I mean, it's, we don't need to, but it's a, a decision we can make for the betterment of ourselves and others, which is the buck ends with me. I'm going to address this so I don't pass it on. From my own experience, it's the toughest thing to do. Yeah, it is. I think it's, it's very challenging, but it's very brave. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it's like, I'm going to rewrite the narrative and the story now so it doesn't continue. Yes. Don't pass on to my, to my children or to next mm -hmm. generation. So would you say you are doing it through oh, your practice, through working yeah, on I yourself? Have, I, yeah, I am. I, I am far, I mean, I don't like the word perfect because it's a ridiculous word. I mean, I don't, yeah. it doesn't exist. You know, I 
slip up I pick myself up I you know get on different challenges come don't they at different points in our lives um um but yes that's what I am aiming and striving to do in life is is constantly doing that um I think it's important to say that that the alternative is is not great really because we could say, oh gosh, it's it's hard work. It doesn't, you know. Um, but what is the alternative if we don't do anything? If we just go, okay, I'm just gonna, you know, go partying and forget about all this. Then we don't stay the same. Actually, I personally think that if we if we're not somewhat progressing, then we're likely to go backwards. If we don't deal with this stuff, it won't get any better. It will fester. And it reminds me uh, um, of like a snowball, you know, think of generational stuff. There's a snowball effect rolling down the mountain, it accumulates, yet it is possible to begin to melt that snowball, you know? And um, and your life is richer for it. And I think we sometimes, I, I've certainly been caught up in this trap um, in the past where you think, Oh gosh, here I am again. I thought I dealt with this. Can you relate to this? Yeah, a lot. <laughs> I'm, sure your, I'm sure your viewers can. Oh gosh, I thought I dealt with that issue, and here it is again. And I personally find a really useful way to uh, look at that is it's not linear. Yes, we can move forward. I'm not saying that, but it's and it's not circular. I I personally feel that it's a spiral that we might return to something, but not in exactly the same way. And we learn from that. And it's a big part of my work actually is, um, you know, my kind of messaging is, you know, life shock to life shift, you know, turning, um, transforming adversity. And, um, and so I really do believe as difficult as our challenges, such as something like cancer or bereavement or job loss or whatever, as challenging as that is, these are gifts, ultimately, because these teach us so much. You know, um, I think in in Japanese culture, there's this, um, they call it, I think it's, I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly, kintsugi, where they have the, say like a vase, a precious vase was broken. They mend it with gold and resin. And they are beautiful pieces. You can actually do this yourself today. And... I think it's important to remember that, that when we, you know, we evolve and we feel like we might be broken, what we rebuild from that and move forward in actually can be more beautiful. And it's from the challenges that we rise up and we learn the most from. And I say this in my, my blog, I've written about this, you know, dinner parties, holidays, fun with friends and family, all wonderful. We need them, bring it on. Yet our biggest lessons, if you reflect back, your biggest lessons in life, leaps forward, all of that come from the challenges. It's the gift from it. I completely agree with that. <laughs> I, you, you stole the answer before I asked the question. <laughs> uh, oh, I have amazing. that way. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to ask you because you were talking about your cancer journey and um, like my next question was like, do you find any meaning? Did you find any meaning in that? Or do you do you find did you find it as something very like not nice and uh, challenging? But also have you been able to reframe that experience into a power, a wisdom, which yes. oh my gosh, you have yeah. been? Oh yeah. I mean, um as you know, challenging as it was, and I know there's many people who've gone through challenges like that and more, and we don't want to go through them, but yes, I like I said, it was my spiritual awakening, which has changed my life. I, I follow my own spiritual path now. A big part of it has also been around boundaries. Mm. Um, so, yes, I, I I let go of some things in my life. I kind of, uh, after all of that, I kind of made some, you know, typical dietary changes. and But I also detoxified my energy field. I had uh, lots of um, healings and, and things like that. But um, getting boundaried around uh, toxic behaviors of others um, and not accepting certain behaviors. And it really made me reevaluate that. Um, 
you know, I think they say um, that you become the five people you spend the most time with. Yeah. So think about that. Who are you spending the most time with? And are they contributing to your life or are they draining it? You know, um, and that's not to say, you know, our friends go through challenging times and, and we need to be there for each other. It's not that. It's those this kind of behaviour, which is literally not respecting boundaries and, 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 you know, people that are just not good for you. So it taught me that. And I'm much more boundaried um, around things like that now. Mm -hmm. And I think it's directly linked to the values or the kind of self-love or self-respect we have towards ourselves the boundaries, if we start realizing that this is not helping, this is actually dragging me down. And if I respect myself enough or I love myself enough, I am able to set those healthy boundaries. Would you say that? Would you agree? What do you think? Yes. Yes, I, I would. It's like working on that on a daily basis, um, coming back to the present moment, you know, reflecting on, you know, using all the different thing tools you can use, such as journaling and gratitude practices. There's lots of different things I could share. And kind of having a, you know, reevaluating your life and seeing the things that are working and the things that are not, the things that you're tolerating or places that you feel you're being tolerated. You don't want to be tolerated. You want to be celebrated. And mm. so sometimes it comes back to it's that chicken and the egg thing, isn't it? So sometimes it's just about doing it first, you know, just making that decision and as best as you can doing it. Um, and also on a daily basis, filling up your love tank mm -hmm. so that, and, and doing things that are going to increase your self-worth, your self-love. Um, so I'd say I'd, I don't know that one comes before the other. I think it's good if we can put both in place. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> um, I work with women who in a coaching practice and the thing I noticed is like the beliefs are repeating itself, self-beliefs, um, playing small, lack of self-love, I'm not good enough. Um, do you think it has something to do with the generational trauma as well? But where do you think that those beliefs are coming from? Is it the childhood? Well, I mean, again, I'd say it's not a cop-out, but it's very individualistic. Mm -hmm. But it's likely that a lot of this starts um, either in early childhood that is passed through generations. But and we also need to acknowledge the world that we live in. Okay, um, we are bombarded. So, so just to, to finish that part, we yes, I I do believe that if we grow up in an environment, environment could be schooling, could be parenting, could be who, whatever you're exposed to that is negative, critical. Then of course, when you're in theta. As I said, you know, when you're young, that's you're going to be absorbing that like a sponge. So, yeah, no doubt about it. Um, and we live in a world where, you know, we, you know, social media, advertising, all the things that are trying to sell to us. And <laughs> and of course, that they do that from a, you know, a psychological perspective of you're lacking and therefore you need you're not good enough so <clears throat> i would also suggest minimizing or eradicating exposure to these types of things you know i don't watch adverts there's no way i'm watching adverts <laughs> you watch tv huh you watch tv i do i'm very selective news. i watch i don't want i don't watch news no uh, that's not to say i'm ignorant um, <laughs> uh, I do stay, um, you know, up to date, but I, I, um, I stop watching regular news because I just think it's not helpful. Oh, and, and when I was reflecting on um, preparing, you know, for this podcast, it got me to thinking of, you know, if, if we were born a hundred years ago, right? You in where you're, you were born, and me here. So I was born in in England. And I was, most people would have been living in the countryside um, and they would have not had TV, social media, all those things that have had the little community and, oh yes, did you hear that Mr. Brown fell over and broke his leg or whatever? And you'd, you'd, <clears throat> you'd be exposed overall to a much smaller 
amount of um, collective bad news, shall we call it? Yeah. <laughs> so it's not just news, is it? It's bad news. Um, and then maybe people would, you know, telegrams and people come through town and you would have heard news about wars and things like that. But when you consider that to what we are exposed to today, if we allow it, if we don't put the boundaries in place, you could have the TV going on in the background constantly with the news constantly. Um, you could be on social media interacting in groups that aren't good for your mental and emotional health. So if you're doing, you know, our evolution hasn't caught up and will it ever and should it ever? Does that make sense? So, so now we can be exposed to so much that is reinforcing that you're not good enough. Yeah. Um, and I don't think it's personally, I don't think it's that healthy. So I would suggest looking at what it, what's in my life. What is my, you know, my daylight? What's, what do I do every day? Do I automatically sit down at lunch and put the news on or, and do I want to be doing that? And that's not to say that we, we want to remove ourselves from society or, um, you know, of course, be aware and help others to, you know, pick a cause and help people either through your work, charity or whatever, but we can't, each individual can't spread ourselves out into a million pieces and, and, and be and doing all of it because it just can't work like that. Mm. You can tell I'm on my high horse about that one, but <laughs> there's truth in it, I really do. You mentioned previously that um, once we are aware, basically, what is not working for us or what we need to change or improve or heal, we might be able to slip into the old kind of ignorant position and pattern mm -hmm. of like, I don't want to, and I just want to stay where I am. But I think once we have the awareness, it's kind of difficult to ignore the things or stay with them if we are aware of the things, of the um, traumas, let's say. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I uh, I agree. I think awareness is huge and cultivating that because it's not just, a, you know, a, one-time thing is it it's yeah. like we have to cultivate that and I think it's also about taking responsibility because you know um you hear sometimes don't you people saying well that's just the way I am you know some people yeah it's just the way I you know just the way I am that's it and that's a very fixed mindset way of being and I think it's that as human beings I personally feel it's our responsibility to say well actually uh, developing a a growth mindset where we say well actually we're ever evolving I mean I'm not the same person I was 10 years ago and I don't want to be the same person I am now in 10 years time and that doesn't mean to say I don't know who I am or what I stand for but I see it as growth so if we and within that language is so important how are you speaking you know I like the expression um as a name of a book actually called uh, your word is your wand hmm. You know, how, how you speak, how you think is is how you create your reality. If, we, if we're constantly saying I can't change or repeating that kind of programmed thinking, then guess what? We, we won't. And we all get caught in traps, all of us at times. And then when we do, it's about not giving ourselves a hard time. And I think as women, sometimes that can happen. Being hard on ourselves. Yeah. Does that kind of answer? What yeah, 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 yeah. Um, what I'm thinking about as well is, um, at least myself, I grew up with kind of this narrative in my head, and my life looks looked like that uh, many years. That I should be there for others, kind of all the time. I should be helping this person, that person. Um, I should be available all the time. So I think we as women we are tend to look at other people's well-being more than our own and then I think the result of that can be I don't know who I am I don't know what I enjoy I don't know what I like what would you tell to the person who is at this point of awareness of that that is ready to change that but they don't know who they are they don't know because they have been living their life for others 
Well, I would say if they're at that point that they're aware of it and they want to change, I would say, yes, well done. <laughs> well done, celebrate that first. Like, <laughs> celebrate that. Yeah. That's amazing that you have actually woken up to this, woken up to the conditioning or however you want to see that. And you're saying, I want to change this. And this whole thing of, I don't know who I am. It's, it might sound, I don't know what this will sound like, but in some ways that's, a, you know, I know that could be a bit unnerving for people, but trying to reframe that and think, well, let me try and play with this. Let's be playful with this and think, okay, there's opportunity here. Yeah. To start to put some boundaries in place because we can't be all things to all people. Mm. We are here, I believe, on a soul journey to um, to learn and grow. And of course, we're part of the whole, we're part of the community and we want to give. But there's an old saying that you can't pour from an empty glass. So if you give everything constantly, you'll end up getting ill emotionally, psychologically, physically. So there's that. So there's a recognition. But coming back to your the part of your question is just coming back to yourself and go, OK, what do I know about me? What do I know that I don't like? This is, can be un underestimated. What don't I like? What don't I want? So if you don't know what you do want, get really super clear. This is part of one of my workshops, actually, that I, I do. Hmm. Um, because once we get clear on what we don't want and we safeguard that as best as we can, and you'll notice I always say as best as we can because that's all we can expect of ourselves, right? Yeah, yeah. When we safeguard that, then we're not going to find ourselves veered off down some turning that's going to be difficult to backpedal from. Does that make sense? Yeah. Say for example, when I was in recovery um, from cancer, I was like, okay, I got to that point. What don't I want? Um, I don't want to work for somebody else going forward was my main thing. Mm -hmm. So as best as I could, I safeguarded that. And I wanted to be able to work remotely as well as in person. And by safeguarding that, I was able to build from that. So get clear of what you don't want in your life and then get playful about what you do. What do you enjoy? Try some new things. Go to a yoga class, go to a, I don't know, something different that you wouldn't try, martial arts or, and some things you'll go, you know what, not for me, but you might just gain some inspiration, an art class, uh, I don't know, <laughs> whatever, it doesn't matter what it is. So you're playing with it in um, a joyful way we need to invite joy in because if we're if we're approaching it in a fear anxiety based way and you know I've done that let's be <laughs> honest we've all done it we all did, yeah. that will stifle you and so what we're wanting to do is invite joy invite play and fun mm -hmm. and then it will and acknowledge that it is baby steps that we'll get there and a few along the way we might take a few giant leaps and exciting yeah and it's coming back also to that point that you mentioned already is to be compassionate with ourselves and patient on the journey it, overall <laughs> it's absolutely yeah. fundamental I've actually again it's, it's on my website if anybody wants to see it but um, I've got a free meditation and workbook and in the workbook it's it's kind of mindfulness based and in the workbook I I do my version of the um, something about eight um, mindful attitudes and these are things we bring not just to our practice but to our lives kindness curiosity so when you're exploring you don't know who you are oh, okay reframe that I don't know who I am so it'd be exciting to meet this person <laughs> yeah meet this person but also create yeah this person because yeah. who we are isn't fixed in stone and nor should it be right because it's your it's our choice I mean I tro totally believe that we do have a soul's essence, a core of who we are, without a doubt, and we shouldn't, you know, deny that. Yet, and again, this is a big part of the work I do with people, is get familiar with that essence. But as, uh, but, but you have a choice in the directions that that goes. And depending on where you are in your life will be, um, it will change and evolve. So it's life expression 
so sorry soul's essence versus mm. soul's expression does that make sense yeah it's nice it's nice <laughs> <laughs> yeah i believe actually i believe because i work with the uh, people sometimes who are so deeply um aligned with what other people tell them who they are or the people who hurt them with the pain so basically they they can't see other way they can't see they can be healed they don't want to because they are dead so but also i'm trying to remind them in the coaching practice like this is not who you are mm-hmm. look down deep into your soul and i truly believe even the people convicted of of murders or these kind of things i think deep down they are this true light essence it's the pain it's the hurt it's whatever they experienced that made them basically act or behave and live their life in the way they they chose that but unconsciously mm. and we can always course correct some mm. things are harder to course correct than another I, I, I acknowledge that but I like that expression course correct because it gives us that freedom doesn't it so say if somebody goes oh I've got regrets I did this and that and why did I get it's like okay that happened and you may need to grieve it you mourn it whatever and then there comes a time it's like okay but now start today start in this moment because this moment is all we have is each moment um if it's okay I I felt quite called to say this today if it's all right but go on um about bringing ourselves into the present moment because some people say well how do you do that when you're out and about and and you know some people think well you've got to be sitting in lotus pose for hours on end and you can do that you can if you like um but it's just the little things throughout our day and some of that is just connecting with nature if you've got a garden or a park putting your feet on the ground if you you know looking out the window looking out the window even if you live in a city there will likely be a tree there will certainly be the sky at some level connecting with nature um connecting with the breath placing your hand on your heart and taking a few breaths energy flows where attention goes right so it's just we have everything we need in our in our bodies our bodies are incredible and one of the things I have at the moment which I've been using I've got my little my little my little bag here what is (laughs) in the bag open the bag bag. (laughs) (laughs) it's my little I don't know I wouldn't call it a medicine bag quite but it's got my little things that because I also think that if we're experiencing either trauma or anxiety, bringing us back to through our senses into the present. So that sight, looking at something beautiful, reading a beautiful poem, um, putting something beautiful on your skin that's natural and going to be good for you, um, smelling something. So this is where this comes in. So this is a natural rose essence. Um, I made myself some um, blue lotus essential oil with moringa. So um, these are the types of things um, I have in my little, my little, you know, peppermint to clear the he- the head, and it sounds sounds simple, and it is, but actually, it it can be really beautiful and really bring you back to that high vibration because, like, essential oils have that high vibration. It's like using sound, right? Mm. I use tuning forks as well to get back in alignment, and so that's what that's what I do. So smelling a rose in the garden putting your feet on the earth, um, eating something, drinking something beautiful, doing it mindfully without the TV on. The little things are the big things. Yeah, the most simple things sometimes are the most powerful and we all have them, the reach of the hand. Absolutely. But we are reaching far there for medication, far there for something very complicated and expensive and we just forgot the simplicity of life. Mother Nature holds yeah. a lot of it. You know, sometimes people need medic. I'm not, not anti yeah. that at all. Yet we can, you know, often it's within our own bodies. I think about it. We have our breath that we can return to as an anchor. We have our feet that we can put on the floor, opening our chest, putting our hand on our heart. You know, we have all these things. And yes, it's important, those who can, who have access um, to reach out to people like coaches or healers or whatever, We all need assistance. I have my own coaching. Um, We don't need to do it alone. I'm just saying that on the kind of moment by moment basis. So it's all those things. Yeah. So 
you're on the journey of awakening still. Am I right? I to the day I take my last breath. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I am as well. Um, so <laughs> what, what do you, what's your standpoint of like, um, what the future holds in terms of collective consciousness and awakening? Oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I've got what do you think? just listening. No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a big question, but, yeah, but no. good one. Um, I personally think that the planet, the universe is going through a an upgrade, an evolution. I believe that we're entering into what we were entering into. Some people call it the Aquarian age, don't they? Like into a new age. Um where people are more um, more enlightened, uh, that the collective consciousness, the vibration of the planet is um, being raised. There are some that are, you know, we know is even acknowledged by NASA that um, we have uh, lots of solar flares coming from the sun. Things are, you know, coming from this, you know, um, from the universe that I believe is upgrading the planet. And um, and I think we're in a tra- very much a transitionary phase where you've got the old system mm. and then the new one coming in. Of course, when you've got an old system, it's kind of trying to hold on for dear life. Um, and that's kind of what's going on in the world right now. So I think there's a lot of change. I think it depends on us as individuals that make the collective, right? Because as mm. individuals... And that's why I think it's important for us all to connect with like-minded people. And I don't mean people who are just going to agree with us. I don't mean that. I mean, people who are wanting to elevate and wanting to grow and um, more towards the light. And um, so I, I think broadly, that's where we're at. Is that kind of what you were you were thinking? Yeah, yeah I just wanted to know uh, your opinion. And yeah 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 I totally pain. think and I'm I'm hopeful I mean like everybody I have my moments where I think oh my gosh look at all this going on around the world <laughs> you know we are going through a huge transitionary phase uh, I'm not an astrologer for but those who follow astrology uh, I do a little bit um you know there's a lot going on there in the alignments um right now um so if that interests you it's something to look up but um I am hopeful I'm hopeful that people are resilient and I believe that a lot more people are waking up yeah I hope so too really hope so but it's very important I think to surround yourself with the like-minded people as you said yeah to keep that vibration high <clears throat> support yourself and others yeah and one lesson I've learned if I may share this mm-hmm. is um it's not it's important for us to obviously help ourselves you know the you know it's the it is now an old cliche of you're on the flight and they say you know put your mask on before you do anybody else and that is key and we do help others but also steering away from unsolicited help is that the right term unsolicited help yeah um, unsolicited in other words um trying to impose what we think on other people Mm. To stay away from that. If people are open and they want it and they want the change and they want the growth and, they, and they're on that vibrational match, then by all means, help them as much as you feel able and assist. But I, I've learned a lesson um, of, you know, moving away from offering that to those who who don't want it. <laughs> yeah. Actually, it's not our place to do that. I mean, I have in the past done that. I, yeah. Me too. I try it <clears throat> hard sometimes to change. It's difficult with loved ones and family, but we also need to realize that they're also yeah. only people and they have their own journey, trajectory, okay. and they'll be ready when they will be ready. Exactly. Yeah. And and if they're not, then that is also oh, there. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Liz, tell me, what is your ultimate goal? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> I need to review that. <laughs> My ultimate goal. Yeah. Personally, professionally, or both, all of it. Your ultimate goal as a soul in this universe. Oh, my gosh. Oh, I'm actually <laughs> glad you asked me that now because recently I feel quite emotional mm. saying this. Actually. I can feel it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
um recently I, um, I went to Egypt in May it's my second trip this is relevant <laughs> and I um and I kind of thought why have I gone back in a similar capacity what what is the learning here and it was a beautiful experience I went to temples the I played flute in the um, king's chamber I mean gosh who gets to do that and many other beautiful beautiful experiences with predominantly a group of women and it was very much a sound journey uh, sound initiated um sound activation and and when I got back I thought what you know what is the learning what is the messages from all of this kind of beautiful mysticism or whatever and in short <laughs> it was um that simple but profound Liz continue to go in transcendence is not up it's in you transcend through connecting to your heart and then and that inner journey so that you are more in tune more in alignment so when people are asking you or you're not clear of the direction you want to go you are that attuned that it's it's more accessible to you. It's like the it's like the ancients, isn't it? That that I believe in, like golden ages and things like that. They were, or some tribal people today, that their senses are so heightened to certain ways of being. And so for me, that it sounds very simple. It's not. It's not easy. I don't think. And um, and so the journey that I think that the ancient Egyptians and others were talking about was the journey from the base chakra right up to here and beyond and that's ascension so it's coming back aligning with the energy centers and when we do that and we transcend whatever that means to you that we learn we grow and that overflow goes to our clients our family our friends nice love that <laughs> Yeah, that was quite a bit. It's quite a, it's quite a tall order, but I, but I think that again, not to kind of elevate that. It's <clears throat> again that is a process. It's not to say that I've just oh yes, and I'm going to do this. It's how do I cultivate that, and I want to start doing more of the, uh, you know, longer chakra meditations and things like that to connect more deeply. Mm -hmm. I hope that answers your question. <laughs> yeah. Yeah um what is your message to the women listening or people listening right now um what is the one thing you would like them to take away maybe from our conversation the answers are inside of you it's all within you and I want them to take what they need from this podcast, whatever that is. It might be the one tiny little thing. What kind of raised your vibration when you heard it? But ultimately, it's the inner journey. We often look outside. I've spent more time than I would like care to admit of looking outside of myself, asking others, what should I do with, you know, ultimately the what is needed is more returning to the self and just to reiterate we we often need people to help us on that journey it's not a solitary journey does that make sense it's it's not that i'm saying we hide ourselves away and do it on our own we don't mm -hmm. it's an inner journey but it's anything that can facilitate that and i know it's more than one thing and not to take it so seriously not to take everything <laughs> so seriously in, and this is something that I've been talking to my husband about it's like inviting more fun and joy into our lives more frivolous fun the world can be a serious place at the moment um do what you can but make space and time for fun and enjoyment because all of that energy will emanate from you and affect everybody even somebody you walk past in a supermarket We'll feel that. Our field stretches, what, six feet or something from us? And you might just smile at somebody walking down the street and they will feel, you never know, it might be 
an elderly person who hasn't spoken to somebody all day and it's just made their day. You don't know. True. <laughs> Love that. Where can we find you uh, if would, we would like to maybe join your um, workshops or sound healing um, meditations? Um, so what, what is, what's the best way how to get in touch with you, Liz? Yeah, um, it's kind of, I would say um, I'm on Instagram. I think you're going to share with the notes. I'm going to share, yeah. yeah. So I'm on Instagram. I think it's a lot Liz.Keats. Um, and, you know, I've got a Facebook group meant for more. My website is a great place that you can book a free call if you want to connect and explore. Um, there's the free meditation on my website. If the, uh, you know, the kind of cancer journey aspect and what to learn from that uh, was uh, resonated. I've got a blog on there. It's called, it's a bit in your face, but it's called the tit is back, meaning reconstruction. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, um, you know, so there's, I'd say drop me an email. I mean, I love to hear from people um, in terms of sound at the moment. I'm doing that in person. Mm. I'm doing it at a few festivals. It's best to go on my website and to my events page. And um, but I'm in East Sussex. So if you're around the area, um, then I'd, I'd love to welcome you. So I think those are the best ones. But just drop me a line. I'd love to hear from you. Thank you, Liz. So, yeah, I'm going to share all of the links, um, how you, you can talk and get in touch with Liz in the description of the episode well Liz thank you so much I enjoyed the conversation a lot um, oh yeah me too and I had some insights myself to be honest with you oh great yeah and you um, want to share <laughs> all right uh well <laughs> Not to you. On. yeah 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 um I've I was thinking about some things because I will be a guest on the podcast soon and I was thinking about what is my ultimate goal or what is my kind of like a philosophy in life and I think the growth itself is is the is the goal for me and the tool for that is constant change mm. and I love change and I keep sharing that with my clients and with my um with people who I know that change for me is like it's one thing I can't be without in life because oh, I don't it. like to be in one place and especially in a place where I'm not happy and I not, don't feel aligned. I can't be there a mm. l- long time. So I'm seeking change. That's something about me. Um, but I had insights about like, uh, I'm trying to grow. I'm trying to maybe help others through working on myself. Mm-hmm but maybe trying to do it in more fun way and not mm-hmm. taking it so seriously, which I sometimes do. So just try trying to kind of bring that light and easiness into my life rather than kind of pressure and thinking and mind rather to connect with my heart a lot more because I used to do many It's easy to fall into that. Yeah, yeah. It's this ego and analytical mind, right? So, yeah, I think I will take away this thing to invite more curiosity and more fun and enjoyment into all this awakening. Absolutely. It did freeze a little bit there, but I I think I caught um, most of it. But, oh, wonderful. And I need to remind myself that we all have things going on in life that can be pretty serious, you know. Um, And it's about engaging with that the enjoyment and, and fun so I'm, br- I'm really happy and I just want to say thank you for um having me on your podcast it's been an absolute joy you've asked me some beautiful questions and you've got a, a gorgeous energy and um thank I'm you, really happy to co- have connected with you so thank you 